Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander Technique teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska. I also teach in Toronto, Canada and uh, online. My guest today is Penelope Easton, who is an Alexander Technique teacher in County Clare, Ireland. Uh, she studied zoology at Cambridge, then trained to be an Alexander Technique teacher. And after that, uh, worked for about four years with Margaret Goldie, also known as Miss Goldie. And that experience set her off on a 30 year journey to understand what was different about Miss Goldie's teaching and what was this, what is the science behind it. She's written a book about this called The Alexander Technique, 12 Fundamentals of Integrated Movement. And you can get information about that on her website, which I'll be posting by the interview. Penelope, welcome. Well, hello, Robert. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, we're doing a series of podcasts on this uh, general topic. And today, uh, we're going to talk about the early history of the Alexander Technique in a sense, how Alexander came to discover the Alexander technique, you might say, and uh, a bit about the evolution of his thinking uh, and the, his way of teaching in the early years. So welcome to the show again. And uh, you know, the first question that um, you read the story, the standard story about Alexander and his voice issues and so on, which I think most of our listeners will be uh, familiar with, um, it does seem like a stroke of genius on Alexander's part to start using mirrors to observe himself. And uh, I believe your take on it is that that wasn't necessarily an original idea on his part. Could you say something about that? Sure, yes. Um, there was, it probably wasn't his idea because um, in, uh, we know that he just, he, we know that he studied the Del Sartre method mm -hmm. and um, this collection of articles and lectures that uh, Moritz puts out. Mm -hmm. um, they actually print his business card from around about 1904, where he says he's a teacher of the Del Sartre system. Right. And um, when it, <laughs> a lot of teachers have looked at that, and it was a man called Jean de Masuera, who you and I both know, who really pieced it together. But the popular book of um, Del Sartre's work, and just to backtrack, Del Sartre was a Frenchman. He was uh, Francois Del Sartre, Fran Francois Del Sartre, and he was born in 1811, died in 1871. But he was called at the time the voice doctor because like Alexander, he lost his voice through singing rather than through acting and mm -hmm. set about finding how he could mend it again. And, realized that the body is far too complex for us to be dealing with it ourselves and that the voice box is slung within that whole musculature me mechanism and that you can't directly work on the voice and a lot of singing instruction because it goes directly to the voice is therefore creating harm. And he realized you'd got to balance the whole physical structure and you couldn't do it through the body. You had to do it through the brain. So already you can hear there's a lot of Alexander's premises <laughs> in there that didn't come from him. And, and that's quite shocking when we first hear it because that amazing chapter, Use of the Self, very much sort of gives on the idea that he developed it all himself, all by himself, as if Tasmania and Australia were at the time a cultural desert, and they mm -hmm. weren't. There was all sorts of things going on. Um, but just, uh, just to pause for a second. So Del Sartre, uh, this is Francois Del Sartre. He was a professor at the Royal 
Academy of Singing, I think, in Paris. He was Royal, Royal, Royal College of Music. Royal College Paris. of Music, yeah. and he was a pretty prominent guy in in France. And the and he, as part of his journey of self exploration, he used mirrors. That was his kind of his basic teaching methodology, as I understand it. Now, the question, the question then, of course, is, well, how did Alexander know about this guy? Because uh, he was living in France and Alexander was in, in Australia and there were, Del Sartre didn't, hadn't apparently written anything at that point. So how did he even find out about it? And of course, the answer, just real briefly, is that Del Sartre had a younger brother who also taught this method. And this younger brother, through a series of bizarre circumstances, immigrated to Australia in 1851. He arrived in Tasmania, of all places, and set up shop there. And by the way, his original building is still there into in Hobart yeah uh, and he influenced uh, a lot of people uh, actors and singers and so forth and so Alexander when he came on to the scene somewhat 18 years later when he was born and then later started his his own career uh, Del Sartre was kind of everywhere uh, as a as a methodology even though Francois himself I think died in 18. 70 some sometime in the 1870s yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's that's how that's how it came to him and that's um has always been a puzzle and i think now we have a pretty clear idea that that's that's what happened and so, i think in fact there are three different ways in which alexander could have uh, discovered the technique because if you read the, the, the Alexander historians, whether you read, um, you know, Malcolm Williams has done a lot and Murray's done a lot, Alex Murray, um, Jerome Starring, um, Jando has done a lot of research and they all actually have a different theory. Mm -hmm. um, Jando is the one who's discovered the Camille link. Mm -hmm. And um, what he also has picked up is that Edith, who later became his wife, that she was a child in the town in which um, Camille was really working. And coming from a wealthy family, she would almost certainly have taken her singing and acting lessons with the best person in the town of the day, and that would have been Camille Del Sartre. So um, Alexander's own wife might well have had a lot of lessons from that. Um, also, um, Genevieve Stebbins um, wrote uh, the main book that popularized uh, Del Sartre's work in America. And that was published in 1885. And that was probably in Australia at the time. And um, she very much puts in about the mirrors. So that might well have, you know, he might well have read Stebbins's book. And then his acting teacher, James Cathcart, um, he had been in London working in a production that Steele McKay was in, was, was starring in. And Steele McKay had worked with Francois Delsart and was a major fan. And in fact, he was the one who took it to America. So if James Cathcart had been in the same production, you know, he would have learned quite a lot of Del Sartre from there. So there's a whole set of ways in which Alexander would have been surrounded by Del Sartre, I think. And at some point he obviously did a little training in it as well. So, right, yeah. right. And as, as Jean Doe points out, he would not have put down on his business card that he was a teacher of the Del Sartre method, unless he did have some experience with it, because it, a lot of other people in Sydney and Melbourne knew about Del Sartre, and it would have, they would have spotted a fake right away, is, is my, my assumption. So initial, his initial teaching then apparently uh, did not involve him using his hands to teach people. Not at all. No, he didn't use his hands for 20 years. So, so let's actually track because there's about four or five points at which the technique takes a significant development. It didn't just, you know, emerge fully fledged out of that standing in front of the mirrors by any means. Right. Alexander actually started as a breathing coach, didn't he? I mean, it was, mm -hmm. that was when, when people have gone digging for all those early business cards and um, news bills and adver advertisements that he did, he was teaching what he called natural elocution, which meant 
you know, breathing and the and how you used your voice, mm -hmm. not just aimed at actors, I think, but at the general public as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where he started. And the Dels artwork, he must have learnt, we presume he learnt the Dels art, but he certainly learnt something early on because again, he says he took 10 years to to, to solve his problem. But actually, the the handbills of the day tell a different story. He had to cancel an engagement, I think, in um, late um, 83. And he was back touring in early in 84, 94. So um, from 93 to 94, there was probably about eight months in which he was off work because of his voice and standing in front of those mirrors, probably working for hours and hours and hours every day in front of the mirrors. And he was working on himself. So let's not knock him for saying, oh, you pinched it all from every other people. Oh, certainly not. No, he, he did the work. He did the work. He and did the work. He, absolutely. Yeah, but but it did not take him 10 years. Uh, the, him. I think that timeline is thoroughly discredited. Just if you look at the dates and it, it, you can't find the 10 years really. Um, so, mm -hmm. and and there, as you say, it could be as little as uh, less than a year. I think John Doe thinks it could be a year and a half, who knows? I mean, we don't know exactly. And it probably wasn't like a, a sharp thing where he suddenly, okay, now that's, this is what I'm doing. Maybe mm -hmm. he was still working on himself and practicing with, students absolutely because i think he was working on himself all his life right and yes of course using this stuff he got this self-help stuff all the way through um, right. and not so so he starts off as this breathing coach and he starts off doing um um and rib breathing costal arch breathing and then he moves then he realizes the whole body is involved so he moves to Full chest breathing, as he calls it, and then mm -hmm. again, if you if you track through articles and lectures, those the first sort of twenty years of the of the articles, you see slowly, particularly after he moves to London, that he starts to get more interested in the musculature and the idea that actually the body is part of it, and and there's one point, um, and and you know, kinesthesia comes into his argument and, and antagonistic pulls comes in and mechanical advantage comes in. R sort of between 1906 and 1910, you can see the technique emerging, mm -hmm. but he's still not using his hands. And in fact, the 1910 edition of his first book, Man's Supreme Inheritance, which is quite hard to get hold of. Um, but if you look on page 193, there's the original description of the cigar box procedure where he's getting somebody to lean themselves back in the chair. Now he is using his hands, but he's only using them in a, in a, in a totally sort of manipulative way, just in a, and the supportive way. He's supporting that pupil back in the chair, but the pupil is doing the thinking and he's describing what the pupil is to think and that the pupil is first to give a load of inhibitory you know, what they're not doing, and then he, they've got to give positive, and they've got to remember those instructions, and they've got to be reciting them, and not letting them happen in the physical body, but just letting the movement happen, and then the change will come about. So he's very much getting the pupil to do it for themselves through their brain work. And then, um, so that's 20 years in which he's and Marjorie Barlow asks, um, asked him how he used his hands. And it's in um, oh, this little book. Um, she says, um, um, he just, when he was aware people didn't know how to free their necks, he just naturally put his hands on and showed them. But he didn't think of the hands of doing anything. Mm -hmm. And then, um, round about 1912, and certainly 1914, he tells uh, Frank Pierce Jones, that it was 1914, that he had more time because the war had broken, the First World War had broken out, and a lot of his pupils um, stopped coming, so he had a lot more time to think, and then of course he went to America, so he had time on the ship, and then he was building up a new practice, um, and he started using the inhibitory processes that he'd been using to think, he started applying them to his hands. 
And he realized that he could then, through his hands, bring about the process for himself. And I think there were three reasons that he liked that. Um, okay. That, um, let's let's hear them. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've read you've read Lily Westfeld, haven't you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and she doesn't think he's a good teacher. She doesn't think he's good at explaining. Right. Margaret right. Barlow thought he was a tremendous teacher, but then she knew him well. She was he was you know they were related, but. Lily found him not a good teacher and, and unwilling to explain. And the early accounts of him teaching, he's getting very angry with pupils because they don't explain and because right. they can't understand. And I don't think he was a natural teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and so when he discovered he could do it for them, he was like, oh, God, must, <laughs> that must have been such a relief for him because he could actually get them to get the experience to bring about the change they needed. And they didn't have to do it for themselves. So I think it must have been a huge relief to him that mm -hmm. he no longer had to work quite so hard to get them past their faulty sense of perception as well. Their idea that, you know, why should I do that? It feels wrong. Right. Um, you know, because you've got, to, you've got to, to instruct somebody to do something that feels completely wrong. Why would they do it? So that's the first reason, I think, that actually it was just you know, it made life a lot easier. But I think there's two other reasons too, you know, why he, um, he liked using his hands. And the second is, I think it probably looked cleverer. Um, because there he was in Edwardian England by that stage, because he moved in 1904. And he arrived in Edwardian England as a nobody. Um, and he had to make his way as an uneducated Australian man um, in this very hierarchical, you know, structured and stuffy society. And so if he could do something absolutely a little bit magic, you know, putting hands on somebody and then suddenly they feel completely different. Wow, how did you do that, Mr. Alexander? Mm -hmm. And I think it was probably very good for business. Yeah, and he I'm could sure. probably put his rates up. Um, yep. And it wasn't that he was after the money. It was that he had to make money because he brought his family over, or he was, I don't know whether he brought his family over at that point or whether they were still back in, he probably brought them over by then actually, hadn't he, by 1914. Um, and he was having to support the whole family because there were what, 10 brothers and sisters. He, of them yeah, he, he was the guy who, who was responsible for maintaining this large family of many of whom did not have any money or we're not yeah. doing well. And yes, he brought people over to England and he helped pay for that. That kind of followed him his whole life. Uh, the yeah. money, the money issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he always had to bring the money. And yeah. He brought his mother across and he was yep. supporting his mom, bought a house. So he had to bring the money in. And I think that probably helped because it, yeah. because it, looked, it looked a bit cleverer. Um, and then the third reason is that he was always looking over his shoulder at whether somebody was stealing his work. And that point comes across in um, Peter Bloch's book. Yeah. Um, and it also comes across in, do you know this book, Jerome Starring? Yes, of course. A, oh, yeah. Me about the history Volumes of one and two. <laughs> it's a massive, 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 massive book. Massive um, history of the technique. Done. Yeah. But um, he details you know very detailed all the letters between Spicer and Alexander and the previous doctors and forget their names um, and how Alexander was always you know f fearful that they would steal his method because they would have the kudos as a doctor and he as a, a nobody uneducated nobody from Australia would have none and he would have been he would have been sunk so also you know if 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 he was just doing it for them, then nobody could steal the work anymore. Right. And just a couple of thoughts on that. Um, that moment when he announced, I can get it for them. I don't, uh, I can basically, I can, I can, I can make, I can get them to improve whether they want to or not, sort of. Um, uh, my, one of the directors of my training course, Paul Collins, uh, we were talking about that in a 
group conversation one time and he said well that's a that was a very dangerous moment in the alexander technique and he didn't elaborate on it but that idea stayed with me and i wonder if you could say a little something because now we have historically two almost like two separate processes two separate ways of teaching one not involving hands and one involving hands and the question is, what did we lose and what did we gain? I think what we gained is you could process students more efficiently, you might say, uh, sort of an efficiency argument. Uh, but what did we lose? What did we lose? I, I think that's a very, very good question. And you know, I think Alexander anyway shot himself in the foot. I mean, he <laughs> learnt whether just from Del Sarto or from other sources as well, that um, you have to use the brain because we've got the most amazingly complex structure, 800 muscles. You know, there's no way you can go telling the muscles what to do. And you have to use your brain because they're the onboard computer that has the programs that will, will, will run the, um, the, the muscle arrangements we need. Mm -hmm. And so he knew you had to use thinking in order to bring something different about and if you think into the body if you try and feel your way you stop that process happening right. so the minute you're trying to feel your way through the technique you've lost it and that's something goldie very much brought home to me with this thing of bring your mind to your brain come out of the way just use the thinking right. and what he did was, you know, that first book, um, he was detailing, at least giving an idea about the thinking processes you have to use and very much writing about you have to get the pupil to think. And then when he discovered his hands, he went and rewrote his book. Mm -hmm. And by 1918, that passage I described of the cigar box procedure, it's become a footnote. It's really shortened and it's become uh -huh. a footnote. And it includes that um, really what, you're giving the pupil is you're giving them repeated experiences of a new way of their body functioning so that they can then reproduce using those sensations they can reproduce it for themselves right. now excuse me but that's using feeling isn't it if you're if you're right. looking to reproduce a sensation and he actually writes that so mm -hmm. you've got to um i think one of the things that happened as a result of if you're then to teach somebody using hands giving them these sensations you've got to say to them you mustn't try and feel it out and you mustn't try and do it for yourself and i i feel quite strongly that that's disempowered the pupil and mm -hmm. the pupils become unconfident they, they they can they can take a million lessons and they still don't know quite how to do it for themselves and i think even that's so for teachers you know they still feel mm -hmm. they have to go and take regular trips to lessons and regular trips to other teachers and regular trips to schools to keep their use going that somebody else can do it for them and i would even say i don't think we're doing what it says on the tin do, do you know that advert that where where the man holds up a pot of ron seal paint ron seal you know fence sealer and yeah. he says, and it does what it says on the tin. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a British advert. It's right. One of those, you know, right. Iconic adverts. But um, so it does what it says on the tin. Now, what do we say we do on the tin? We say we teach a pupil to look after themselves in 30 right. lessons so that they can look after themselves for the rest of their lives. Yeah, yeah, and, uh -huh. and and I I have for years, you know, whenever I have a new student, I all and they've had lessons. I always ask them, you know, who did they have lessons from, and some just a few questions about their experience, and and I I always ask them, well, what uh, when you notice something's going wrong, you're not functioning as well as you'd like what's your strategy for dealing with that based on your lessons and almost always the answer is well i just get another alexander lesson um 
there, there's very few students who I'll ask them about directions. I'll say, well, yeah, does the term Alexander directions ever appeared? Some of them have no memory of that, which is odd. Others do, but they'll say, oh, that's what my teacher used. Uh, that was for the teacher. I didn't know anything about it for me. Things like that. And I was, I've always been struck with how, in fact, most Alexander students really don't know how to look after themselves proactively. So um, that would be my and that, But you know, the other thing is, as you say, when he started using his hands in a way that kind of disempowered the students in terms of their own thinking. And, and Alexander bemoans that in um, a quote uh, from an interview with him in the 30s. Uh, one of the students on his training course, uh, Trevelyan, George Trevelyan, there's a whole little article about his uh, questions of Alexander. And Alexander says, uh, uh, right near the beginning of that, you know, uh, none of my, he says something to the effect, none of my students will believe that all they have to do is think the thought and that'll do the trick. They're all slaves to their muscles. And yeah, well, maybe partly because they were trained in, a, in this way you're talking about with experience being given to them by, by a teacher's hands. Yeah, that yeah. that is the primary experience for them in the way they acquired the technique rather than the primary experience for them being the thinking. Right. And when one, when one makes the primary experience for the student their own thinking, I think you get a very, very different outcome. Where yeah. people do have a lot of power to, to, to do it for themselves. And, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, it's been an extremely amazing adventure to learn how to come out of doing it all for my pupils and get them thinking for themselves to the point where now I just work hands off because particularly during COVID, I mean, you know, I have right, right. my room. So maybe um, we should, I think this is taking us towards our next interview, uh, but just to uh, preview a little, I mean, obviously uh, we're talking in 2021, early March, 2021. And for about a year now, a lot of Alexander teachers are, teach, are now teaching online, where of course there's no hands-on work. And a lot of us are finding that's actually in many ways a superior way to teach. More efficient, teach students learn faster. And specifically, they learn how to look after themselves because that's the only option they have. Uh, they've got to actually be students who can, yeah, work on work on themselves and, and they, they they're sort of on the on the first phone call very often it's like oh i wasn't expecting that um and they they sort of say rather dubiously well i'll try a lesson and see how it is because obviously not what they read about right and i haven't had anyone walk away at that point once right. they get that says wow i can do this right well yeah. let's talk a little more about all of that in our next conversation is this okay? Play, good place to stop. So my guest today has, has been uh, Penelope Easton, an Alexander teacher in County Clare, Ireland. And we'll, I'll put a link uh, by the, um, the interview to her website and information on ordering her book and some general information about the Alexander technique. So, uh, Penelope, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you.